Hi everyone. Um, the purpose of this lecture is to introduce you to light sheet microscopy at the Microscopy Services Lab and to describe what you can do, why you might want to do it, and how you can do it. So let's start with what light sheet microscopy is. So light sheet microscopy has several key features. Number one, it is a fluorescence-based technique, so you need to have a sample with fluorophores in that sample. And so those are represented here. The sample is represented by that oval, and the fluorophores are represented by those pink blobs and lines inside. Then you have a laser sheet. That is the light sheet that intersects the sample coming in from one side. You can see this is an XZ view of the sample. So the light sheet comes in from the right in this case and propagates through the sample. And where it intersects the sample and intersects a region where there are fluorophores, it will excite those fluorophores and those fluorophores will emit lower energy photons in every direction. Then you have the third feature of this kind of microscopy is an objective placed orthogonal to the angle of incidence of the light sheet. And this is where you detect the fluorescence that results from excitation with the sheet. Uh, there are many different kinds of light sheets that have these three elements in them, and they're optimized for different kinds of samples and experiments. So if you imagine a big parameter space where you might be interested in samples that are fixed, or samples that are live, and samples that are big, or samples that are small, and for the live ones in processes that move slow or fast, the particular microscope that we have in the Microscopy Services Laboratory, which is called the LaVision Ultra Microscope, really excels for things that are fixed and big. And so this is what it looks like. And in here, the three elements that I described are visible. We have a sample with fluorophores that's supported by sort of a cradle system and is immersed in, an, uh, in a fluid that has the same refractive index as the sample. Uh, that sample is illuminated from the side by uh, a, a light sheet made with laser light, which excites fluorophores in the sample, which emit um, photons of lower energy in every direction and an objective placed perpendicular to the angle at which the light sheet comes in is what collects um, the light, the fluorescence from the sample and sends it up through all these magnification optics and filters to a camera. So that's what light sheet is, and that's the particular kind of light sheet we have in the Microscopy Services Laboratory. Why would you want to use it? So uh, light sheet is intrinsically an optical sectioning technique, so it allows you to see uh, parts of the sample independent of other parts without the need for mechanically uh, slicing it. And so uh, another technique that has that property is uh, laser scanning confocal microscopy. And so it's a good idea to compare light sheet to laser scanning confocal microscopy uh, to get a sense of what the disadvantages or advantages of the techniques are. And so compared to a confocal, light sheet microscopy is much faster. The reason it's much faster is because on a confocal, the way we form the image is we have a laser and we scan it point by point throughout the sample. And so this is an example of a side view of a zebrafish um, embryo. And um, so this is just side view so we can't see the three-dimensional scanning but the idea is the laser has to go to every location in the sample multiple times and it's focused at each of those locations down into a point so the light converges into the sample and then diverges afterwards in contrast light sheet microscopy which is shown down here uh, shoots a sheet of light uh, which again in a side view is seen as a sort of a thin-ish line of light that hits the sample goes through and uh, we don't need to scan this we can just take a picture from this direction, from the top, and that's it. So that is much faster than this illumination arrangement. The other um, major difference um, is that it is a late sheet microscopy is much less damaging than confocal microscopy. In confocal microscopy, we are illuminating things that we are not uh, recovering information from. So we are illuminating things that are out of the plane of focus, which are these cones of converging and diverging light. And so we are bleaching things that we are not looking at. Uh, if we multiply this by many Z stacks that we take of the sample, you can see that this uh, can be quite damaging. In contrast, in light sheet microscopy, we are only illuminating the region that we are actually imaging, and so photo damage is significantly less. So that's uh, why you might want to use uh, light sheet microscopy, because it is faster and it doesn't damage things as much. So um, how do you execute this kind of microscopy? So this is what I'm going to spend most of the rest of my talk discussing.
um, all of what I'm going to discuss, or the overwhelming majority of what I will discuss, um, I've made a guide to using the particular instrument we have. Uh, it's called Ultra Microscope 2, a user guide, not a very original name. And that is available uh, for free, both on PubMed and as a PDF in the Carolina Digital Repository. And I have the links up here if you want to take a look at them. But if you really just Google this Ultra Microscope 2, a user guide, you will find it. So everything I'm going to discuss, um, or almost everything really, is in those guides. So let's say you want... Um, to do this kind of microscopy or you think you want to do it. So what are, what are the requirements? What are sort of the basic things that you need before you can even uh, really get into the nuts and bolts of how to do it? So the first thing you need is a biological question at the right scale. And so what do I mean by that? So the key, the key question to determine whether you have um, a biological question at the right scale is to think about the objects you care about and not so much their size as their spacing. So how far apart on average, are the things that you study. And again, uh, how far apart they are on average is more important than the actual size of those objects, as you'll see in an example that I'll use to illustrate this in a moment. So let's say, for example, that you are interested in labeled axons. So let's say you study some aspect of neuroscience and you want to see how axons traverse a rodent brain. Uh, axons can be labeled with fluorophores and they're very small. Uh, so the diameter of a typical axon is maybe 0.2 microns uh, inside the uh, mouse brain. And so this is actually much smaller than the resolution limit of this microscope, which in the best case scenario is about a micron in the xy dimension and about 5 microns in the z dimension. So this is smaller. This is... Um, this is uh, smaller than the resolution limit of the microscope, and the resolution limit of this microscope is significantly worse than that of a confocal. However, that doesn't mean that you can't see an axon. You can, but they look bigger. And this is because um, the microscope, any microscope really, when it takes an image, it blurs um, sort of the, the image is a blurred version of the object according to certain laws of physics that depend on the lenses and the wavelengths of light involved. And so you can see labeled axons, it's just they look bigger. And so this is really isn't that much of a problem until you have two axons that are close together. So if you really want to trace axons and see where axon 1 and B go, um, this is a problem because you don't know if you have a situation like this or a situation like this. And to really distinguish these, you need to bring in other criteria like, oh, is this one brighter? Or axons tend not to make these turns? Or um, you have to really bring in more information. So if your axons are this close together and you really care about tracing them, this is not going to be the technique that does it. However, if on average your axons are farther apart, then there is no problem tracing them. So this is why I say that the spacing of the objects that you care about is much more important than the size of those objects when deciding whether this technique will provide you with useful information. So let's, let's discuss some examples of questions that are good questions for the ultra microscope that are the correct scale. And so one sort of general family of question is locating cells of interest in large pieces of tissue. So this could be... Um, for example, activated cells in a brain. It could be metastatic cells in an organ. It could be um, immune cells in a lung. Any kind of question where you are searching for a few cells in a very large structure is a good question for the ultra microscope. Another kind of question that's um, almost ideally suited to this microscope is the analysis of vasculature. So the smallest blood vessels are typically a few microns in diameter, and they're typically spaced tens of microns apart from each other. And so that scale is perfectly within the limits of this microscope, and analyzing vasculature is something that which this microscope is almost ideally suited to do. Another example of something of the correct scale is the one we were discussing before. Tracing sparsely labeled axons in the brain is possible with this technique. Even though the axons are small, uh, we can still see them, and if there is sparse labeling, there is little chance that they might cross with axons from another neuron, and so we can trace them appropriately. In contrast, questions that are at the incorrect scale for this kind of microscope, or any kind of question that involves discerning the subcellular details, for example, you know, where are the mitochondria inside cells in a particular organ, you are just not going to be able to do that with this technique. Uh, 
Another thing that will not work is counting every cell in a very densely packed tissue, because if you are trying to count every cell, what matters is not so much the size of every cell, but rather how far apart they are from each other. And so if they're um, immediately adjacent to each other, we won't be able to distinguish groups of cells from really big cells. And so we won't be able to do this precisely. Finally, another example of a question that's at an incorrect scale is tracing individual axons in densely labeled samples, where the probability that the axons will come close together and therefore um, not be distinguishable due to the resolution limitations of the microscope um, will make that uh, question intractable with this system. Okay, so that's the first requirement. You need a, a question at the right biological scale. The second requirement is that the sample has to be transparent. We're talking about very big samples. Um, some of the things that have thrown out there are sort of rodent organs like brains or lungs or maybe even kidneys. Those things are several millimeters or up to even a centimeter in size along at least one of their uh, dimensions. And so we, we know uh, most biological samples of that size simply are not transparent. And so uh, if something is not transparent, you can't get light into and out of it effectively, and you can't do microscopy. So we need to execute a series of chemical steps to take things that are not transparent and make them transparent. And so um, these methods are generally called clearing methods. Um, and uh, there's been ex an explosion of these methods in the last maybe 15 years or so. And so there are different families of these methods. And, and, and you know, the original papers that describe these methods and even the papers that describe these methods now, they always have a figure that looks like this, uh, sort of the magic trick figure where there is an organ before and after clearing. And voila, after clearing, you can actually see through the organ to a greater or lesser degree. And so there are different families of these methods based on different chemistries. Some, like um, the one exemplified here, is based on some hydrogel um, uh, modifications. Others are based on organic solvents that remove, uh, that dehydrate the sample and remove all the lipids. And others are based on cocktails of urea and detergent, like the cubic methods uh, illustrated here. Uh, if you're new to this field and you just want a quick primer uh, that's a little bit out of date, but still it gives you sort of the basic idea of what to think about, um, I wrote a small sort of review about this. It's called The Beginner's Guide to Tissue Clearing, and you're more than welcome to check that out. And it outlines the very basic things you need to think about when you're trying to figure out what clearing method would be most appropriate uh, for your biological problem. And so there are a few key questions you need to think about when deciding on which clearing method you want to use. The first is how big is your sample? The next is whether you need to stain lipids. And if you do, you will probably be out of luck if you answered big uh, to the first question. And the final question is whether you need immunostaining or you're going to use uh, fluorophores that were already embedded in the sample by the time um, the animal that, that, that had the tissue that you cleared was killed. For example, because it expressed it endogenously genetically or because you injected something fluorescent. So if that's not the case and you actually want to do immunostaining, uh, that's a key question uh, that will steer you towards certain clearing methods. And so at MSL, the best answer has usually been the clearing method called IDISCO Plus because samples are usually big. Uh, they're several millimeters in diameter. Um, nobody is really interested in staining lipids so far that has come to the core facility. And almost everyone needs to do immunostaining. And even if they have done um, expression of fluorescent proteins inside the tissue, you can immunostain for those fluorescent proteins uh, with this technique. And so this technique has been around for a while. There's a good uh, source of information at idisco.info. There's sort of very detailed protocols there, examples, links to papers that have used this as well as lists of validated antibodies. And um, I'm quite friendly with the people who made this because I was involved in, in sort of the original version of this. And I can also um, kind of put you in touch with those folks if you have specific questions uh, about the method that we can, can't resolve at UNC. So what does the workflow look like for this kind of microscopy? So how do you go from sample to data? And so the very first step, uh, as you can imagine, is to prepare the sample. Uh, and so this can take between days to weeks, depending on how large your sample is. 
uh, as well as whether you need to stain it. If it's large, the clearing and the staining take longer. And if you need to do staining, the staining takes quite a while. Um, so again, this can take days to week. It doesn't take a lot of work. Uh, it's basically moving samples from one tube to another. So it's not a lot of active time, and meaning you can do a lot of things in parallel. Then there's the step of mounting the sample. So the way these samples are immersed in the microscope, uh, there's, there are no cover slips or slides. So instead, the sample is held from the side by a little screw and uh, just Putting samples into this kind of contraption requires a little bit of manual skill and some sort of artisanal adjustments. And so this typically takes minutes, but for very complicated samples, uh, it can take a lot of sort of thinking and, 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 and careful, again, sort of artisanal adjustments to make this doable. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, then there's the issue of sample imaging, which typically takes between minutes to hours. Um, and this is fairly straightforward in many cases. Um, the, the, if you need higher resolution, it will take longer. If you are uh, fine with sort of lower magnification views of your sample, uh, it will take, it'll be much shorter. Um, this is orders of magnitude faster than trying to do the same kind of imaging with something like a confocal or a multi-photon microscope, which are techniques that scan a point of light throughout the sample. Once we have the data, we need to visualize it. And so visualization is something that's really fast with some of the software tools that are out um, and, and even free right now. And so it can take, you know, uh, for just some very simple visualization, it could take minutes or tens of minutes to just look at the data and, or even make a, a simple movie. Uh, data analysis this can take between hours to months or even infinity uh, because some analyses that you might want to do, uh, there might not be a way to do them. And we'll discuss that um, later in this talk as well. Now, from the moment you start imaging uh, all the way through to the end of the analysis, you're going to have a data management problem because data sets are on the order of tens to thousands of gigabytes. And so you're going to need to move that data, store that data, and back up that data. And so you're going to have a huge problem that if you don't think of in advance, is going to cause you all sorts of headaches down the road. OK, so let's talk about what you can do before, during, and after imaging to make your life a little bit easier. So before imaging, one thing that you should keep in mind is that you should trim your sample based on your biology. So what do I mean by this? I'm going to give the example of the brain again because I like the brain. I'm a neuroscientist by training. And so um, it's just a, sort of a very easy um, thing for me to pull up and, 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 and use as an illustration. So let's say you're studying neurons whose soma is in one side of the brain. And these neurons project all over the brain. So if you're interested in this and your question is how do these neurons project all over the brain, or rather where they project all over the brain, you need the entire brain because else you won't know where they project. But if you already know that these neurons only project to one side of the brain, then you don't need to clear and immunostain the other side. The same goes if you know that certain parts of the brain uh, are not where these neurons go, and so on and so forth. And so why would you do this? If you can get images from the whole brain, why would you bother images getting images from less? And the reason is smaller samples stain faster, they require less antibody to immunostain. They clear faster, and they are easier to image to an extent. If you have a sample that's a fraction of a millimeter, that's much harder. Uh, but usually, smaller samples are easier to image. Um, so this will save you time and money, this trimming based on your biology. So I highly recommend you think carefully about this and try to do it if, you, if it's at all possible. Uh, as far as clearing methods, uh, just to reiterate a little bit, um, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Just basically steal from the best. So use a clearing method that works. What do I mean by that? For a question that's similar to yours, you should see published literature showing that people have done it. There should be papers not just from the lab that created it. Everything works in the lab with the postdoc that spent three years creating a method. What you want is for this to work in a random lab that you've never heard of that actually is not next to the lab that created it. And where it, that's a good evidence that something works, that some other lab 
um, that's not where the method was developed can use it with minimal fuss. And then you want a, a, a method that doesn't require fancy equipment or uh, a lot of uh, fine tweaking and, and, and expensive reagents. Again, in the microscopy services lab, these conditions have been met by the IDSCO Plus technique, and we've seen very good results on brains, kidneys, liver, hearts, embryos, intestine, cochleas, and a bunch of other stuff. So um, we're not married to this technique. If you come up with something else that you feel is a better fit for your biology, we can almost certainly image it. Uh, the only exception are things uh, that require solvents that are very toxic, like ben uh, BABB. Uh, but I haven't yet to encounter a technique where we can't find a workaround to image it. So really, um, pretty much anything you can come up with, we will probably be able to image. So let me give you an example of this. So this is an example that, of data that was acquired in the microscopy services lab by Amanda Ziegler, uh, who is in the blix Lager lab at NCSU, and I believe now she's starting her own lab. And so this is staining of glia in pig intestine. Uh, this was... Um, the clearing and the immunostaining were performed with iDisco Plus, and this is the result of the imaging, or just a short video illustrating the imaging that was done in the light sheet in our core facility. So I'm going to start this. And so what you can see, these are the planes that were imaged on the microscope. Uh, then from those planes, we can reconstruct uh, the structure in three dimensions, re-slice it in an orthogonal dimension, carve out certain areas of interest, like a villi or this sort of plexus here, and then highlight them in different colors. We can also make measurements in those regions, as well as virtually dissect them, which this video doesn't show, but those are things that we can um, do with the analysis and visualization, visualization software that we have. OK, so what other things should you keep in mind as far as sample preparation goes that will make your life easier uh, as you move through the workflow. If you are immunolabeling, which most people are, or even if you are labeling some other way where you're injecting a fluorophore, far red is better. So why is it better? So this is an example of three uh, mouse embryos that were labeled uh, with antibodies that uh, recognize nerves, particular nerves in these animals. And these primary antibodies were then conjugated, uh, were then recognized, excuse me, by secondary antibodies carrying Alexa Fluor 488, 568, and 647 secondary antibodies. Um, as you can see, as you move from the 488 to the 647, the liver, for example, which is highly autofluorescent, becomes transparent, as does a lot of the rest of the sample. And so the reason for that is that autofluorescence goes down uh, as you increase in wavelength. Scattering, uh, which you can think of as sort of um, the opposite of transparency in this case, so that's a simplification, but just uh, take that for now. Uh, that phenomenon is um, not uh, does not affect long wavelength light as much as short wavelength light. And a lot of things that absorb in the spectrum do so at shorter wavelengths. So by going to longer wavelengths die, wavelength dyes, uh, you will get less background and more transparency. And so um, if you're going to use one dye, I would strongly recommend you use Alexa Fluor 647. If you're going to use two, try 568 and 647. And we even have on the system an, a, uh, a laser for even far redder dyes. Uh, so if you have three things you need to label and you're having autofluorescence problems in the 48 channel, we can talk and, and, and figure out ways to work around that as well. OK, so now let's talk about how to optimize mounting. So the samples that you will prepare, you will have to uh, put them into the system with a contraption that, in, you know, in almost all cases, is some sort of ring with a screw that's going to hold the sample in place. And so in this view, which is sort of a view of the sample, which is this brown thing and this uh, holder, which is the black thing viewed from the top, so in X and Y, uh, the light sheet will come in from the right side or from the left side, but let's say for the right from the right side for now. So it comes in like this. So even though your sample is clear, so transparent, uh, the clearing isn't magic. So the further you go into the sample, the more the excitation light gets distorted. So if possible, you want to place the sample in a way such that it is narrower in the X dimension so that the light sheet doesn't have to propagate as far through the sample to get to what you want. Uh, 
Uh, you also want, uh, if possible, to center it as much as you can in the XY dimension, so as close as possible to the center of the holder as opposed to shoved to one side of the holder. And the reason for that is there are some steric constraints where we, when we move the stage around, so it may be very hard to catch a high-resolution view of a corner of the sample if it's not centered in XY. Uh, the microscope has a working distance uh, of about five millimeters approximately, which is the height, this is now a side view of this holder, the height of the pedestals in the holder. And so you don't want samples that exceed that height because you won't be able to image all the way through them in the Z dimension. And you might also crash into them, which could cause some pretty expensive problems. So uh, try to keep at least one of the dimensions of the sample below five millimeters, if at all possible. Finally, if you have a sample where the thing that you're interested is more on one side than the other, it is a good idea to place those things of interest towards the top of the sample because once the light sheet hits um, the things that you're interested in, the distance that the photons will have to traverse through transparent but not perfectly transparent material will be less if those areas of interest are at the top rather than at the bottom of the sample. So. Um, these are ideal uh, guidelines. In many cases, you might find that your sample doesn't fit. Uh, um, all, you know, you can't do all of those things at once. And we have solutions for different kinds of challenges. If your sample is too small, one solution is to embed it in agarose. Um, if you are uh, interested in doing this, or if it turns out that your sample is too small, and so too small means sort of smaller than three or two millimeters in diameter in all dimensions. Uh, you might need to do that, and oh, I can provide advice on how to do that. If your sample is too big, we have custom holders, which are bigger than the ones that come with the system. It can also be cut down to size. If your sample is too soft, uh, we have options where we can glue it down, or again, embedding an agros, which will become rigid after you clear it and can be more easily um, secured inside the microscope. Uh, another common problem is that a sample is too asymmetric, so if one dimension or two dimensions are much bigger than the other one, um, it might be hard to fit it into that contraption with um, a screw. So you might have to cut it differently or glue it down, and we also have developed some custom holders that might help. Um, so here are some of those custom holders for things that are very big. This one is something that's ideal for brains. And this is a little pedestal that helps you fit samples in some of our holders, which have a hole in the middle and are hollow. Uh, and then this is a very useful glue um, that you can use to, to secure things. And it's resistant to dibenzyl ether, which is the common immersion fluid. And it's easily uh, peeled off. And there's a this is a, a European glue that's very hard to get in the United States. But there's a, a US version of this, which one of our users uh, Ken Hudson uh, sort of very generously has shared with us uh, the information for. And so th there are these dental glues that can be very useful if you have a really weird sample that you need to glue down because you can't hold it with a screw from the side. OK, so those are the things that you can do before imaging to make your life easier. Let's talk about some of the things that you can do during imaging uh, or what you need to consider. And so really, you need to know what the key limitations of this kind of imaging are. And so those limitations are, first, you have radial aberrations. Uh, and I'll be very vague and then get into the details of this later. But for now, let me just say that things in the middle of the field of view will have much better quality than, thing as, um, than things far from the center of the field of view. Second, you have an issue with light propagation. If you're using a light sheet from one side, the farther you go through the sample, the worse it will look. And finally, you have an issue with the sheet shape. So I will show you some diagrams that illustrate the fact that the sheet is not actually a sheet. It looks more like a bow tie when viewed from the side. That has major implications for the quality of images as you move away from this sort of center uh, bisecting line. So let's talk about radial aberrations. So these radial aber aberrations are partly due to poor performance on the edges of the objective, and this actually happens in really any objective, but it's particularly noticeable in the objectives that we use in the ultra microscope. Uh, it's also partly due to the fact that uh, we don't illuminate just from one sheet from each side, but rather we have three sheets that are slightly tilted. Um, and so um, I'll show you later a diagram that explains why this can cause these problems as you move away from the center of the field of view. Uh, 
And so what do you do? Let's say you have, again, my sort of standard example is a brain. Let's say you have something like this, and you really care about what's happening on the edges of the sample. So you don't want those edges placed in a, in a position where the quality of the imaging there is worse. And so you have really two options. So you can trade detail for evenness. So if you zoom out, if that is possible, uh, this, so this system has variable zoom. So if you can zoom out and put the, the part of the sample that you really care about in the region of better optical performance, that's one way uh, you can um, have uh, sort of a more even quality. So you've traded detail uh, for um, evenness by zooming out. Um, another option is to trade field of view for evenness. So you can crop. So instead of taking an image over the entire sort of maximally possible field of view, you take an image over a smaller region by cropping it. And in that uh, scenario, um, you don't get as much information because you're dropping all of this stuff. But the information that you get is from a region where it's just much more even. Um, both of these may seem problematic. Um, and you know that's imaging sometimes. You, you have to make trade-offs. Um, you can't get everything you want. All right, so those are radial aberrations. Uh, what other kind of problems does this kind of, or, or things that we need to be aware of, um, what other things uh, do we need to be aware of? So light propagation. So the further you go through the sample, the worse it'll look. This is typically not a big problem in good samples that are well, well cleared, have sort of very clean staining and no bubbles. But if you have a really big sample that's not perfectly cleared, the far side of the sample may not look that great. And so what kind of options do you have? So one option is to image with two sheets. So you can take an image with one sheet from one side, then take another image with a sheet from another side and merge them together uh, by taking the left side from the uh, image illuminated with the light light left light sheet and the right side from the image illuminated with the right light sheet and then merge them by interpolating uh, in a small region in the middle. Um, so that's a solution to that conundrum and I'll show you an example of that. Uh, finally, we have the issue of sheet shape. And so uh, what that does is it makes it so that the middle has high quality, but as you move away from this, the quality deteriorates significantly. And this is a major problem, um, not just in the XY dimension, but particularly in the Z dimension, as I'll show you in a moment. And it's a bigger problem at lower magnification. The reason is at lower magnification, uh, we get more of this sort of edge uh, that has all these problems, whereas if we zoom in and only look at this part, uh, we are looking at, um, at a region where the light sheet uh, has sort of better optical quality. Um, because, and, and this uh, I maybe should make more explicit, um, the light sheet exists independently of the detection optics. So if we zoom in, we don't change the light sheet. We just change what part of the light sheet we're looking at, and we're looking at a sort of higher quality region. And so let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So what is this business of sheet shape? It's related to a parameter called numerical aperture, or NA. And so here what we have in this diagram is uh, an object, which I've made in purple. This is an XZ view of the object. So the light sheet is coming in. And in this case, let's assume from the right side. And we have what's called a high NA sheet. So this parameter in this light sheet is very high. And the characteristics of this high NA sheet are that the waist of the sheet, so this part where it narrows, is very tight, but the Z resolution is very uneven across the field of view, meaning um, that tight waist flares out very dramatically as we get away from the center. And because we're in the Z dimension, having this entire area being illuminated instead of very, a very small and tight region uh, means that the Z resolution will deteriorate when this is thicker. Um, Finally, this is uh, for, for reasons uh, that are not super important right now. High NA sheets, because of the way the optics are constructed, are much brighter than the alternative, which I'll show here, are low NA sheets. So in a low NA sheet, if you lower this numerical aperture parameter, what you have is a sheet that is much thicker, as you can see here, but it is much more even. So the Z resolution of something like this is worse than the Z resolution here, but it is more even across the field of view. And on the edges, it is better than here. Uh, because of the way that this sheet gets constructed, it is much dimmer uh, than this one. Uh, but that can be compensated for with either exposure or laser power or both. Uh, 
And so um, this shows you as well, just to kind of drive the point home, that this is going to be a much bigger problem at low magnification or no cropping scenarios because we are going to capture all of this unevenness in all its um, gory uh, glory. Whereas here, if we have a high mag situation where we zoom in, we're only going to capture this part. Or if we crop the image here, we're only going to capture this one where the problem is not as severe as if we're capturing it across the entire possible field of view. OK, so this uh, bow tie is meant to represent that shape of the sheet in Z. And so what are the options? What can we do uh, given that we need to deal with this problem? So one option, which was sort of illustrated already in the diagrams I've showed you, is you can trade Z resolution for evenness by lowering the sheet in A. So you go from a sheet that looks like this in the XZ dimension to a sheet that looks like this in the XZ dimension. And so the resolution in Z will be worse in this middle region than it is here, but it will be more even throughout. And sometimes that's a trade-off that's very much uh, worth making. So um, let me show you an example of, of some of these modifications. And so this is a sample courtesy of Nico Renier. He's one of the uh, main authors in the IDISCO paper. Uh, this is a brain that was labeled for vasculature. Uh, this is an XZ view. These, excuse me, an XY view. This is an XZ view, and this is a YZ view of the, of the sample. And so these lateral views are taken by cutting the sample along these yellow lines and looking at, at, at them from the side. And so really a very informative view is this one. This is an XZ view. We're illuminating the, the sample from the right side. And so what you can see is for a sheet that has a high in A that's centered in the middle, this part has very crisp details in the Z dimension. But as you get away from that, what you see is a significant deterioration of the Z resolution, which can be seen by the, sort of the streaking in the Z dimension. Uh, in contrast, if you lower the sheet in A such that the region over which it's kind of flat is bigger, even though it is thicker than before, what you have is something way more even. You can combine these two things. Uh, you can combine, ex excuse me, the low sheet in A and illumination from the right and left side and sort of placing the right, left light sheet centered here and the right light sheet centered here to get a more even sample throughout. And that may uh, be a good option if you have a large sample uh, like this one. OK, so that is uh, sort of one solution to the sheet shape conundrum, which is lowering sheet in A. And that can be combined with illuminating with a sheet from one side, then a sheet from another side, and merging the images. What other options do you have? So another option is you can crop. So if this is the region where the light sheet is sort of better performing, instead of taking uh, images over a wider region, you just take an image there by cropping, and then you tile. And so you have really high resolution throughout. Um, this is the strategy undertaken in some of the sort of uh, one of the recent papers using IDISCO Plus for doing a very detailed analysis of vasculature that's come out of the Renier lab. Um, so this is exactly what they did. They figured um, what's the biggest tile where, this, um, where the quality is good enough for us to do our analysis. Then they cropped um, and, uh, and tiled an entire sample by doing this. Now, this obviously takes a lot of time. Uh, another option that you can use is something called dynamic focus. So instead of moving the sample in this case, it turns out that you can change where the sort of focal or waste region of the light sheet is. You can swing, uh, excuse me, I was moving in the wrong direction. So you can change that and take images along various positions and then merge them together with an algorithm. Now, if you do this, beware, because the documentation of the algorithms that do the merging in the LaVision software is very poor. So you will never be able to know um, what that algorithm was doing. And um, with uh, different versions of the software, uh, they, the company may elect to change that algorithm, and you may not even find out. So there's a general explanation of what the algorithm does. But if you're looking for the formula to see what it does to the various pixels, you will not find it. I have asked for it repeatedly. I've never gotten a satisfactory response. So there will be a black box uh, kind of at the center of your image processing if you elect to do this. Uh, you can also, on our system, um, 
elect to gather the raw data for these dynamic focused images and then run them through your own algorithm and so there you'll have full control of what happening of what is happening but that will lead to a massive increase uh, in the in the size of the data sets which might be worth it for you so that's also something to think about okay so as i said uh trading z resolution for evenness by using a lower sheet in a that's actually going to be very fast because you know, it doesn't take longer to image that but if you need to um, crop and tile or use dynamic focus you're going to train time for evenness so there that will be slower but it will be higher quality okay so the sheet shape actually creates more problems than what i've just discussed because it turns out that the way the system is designed uh, you illuminate the sample with more than one sheet from each side so this is an x y view of the sample now so we're sort of looking at it from the top and if you imagine one sheet illuminating the sample and you um, make a graph that shows how thick the sheet is in the z dimension um, in the middle it'll be really thin but as it flares out from the middle it'll be it will be much thicker so this is sort of implicit in everything that i've been discussing is this diagram but it turns out that the system is designed to illuminate with more than one sheet from the side and you know with sheets that are slightly tilted the reason for this is something I discuss in the guide, but it has to do mainly with shadows. This technique is prone to shadowing, and so by having these tilted sheets coming in from the side, you can sometimes uh, sort of see behind things that cast shadows. Um, so that's a that's something that can be very useful, but the problem with that is that each of these independent sheets has their own sort of different area over which the Z resolution is optimal, and then it deteriorates farther away from it. So if you have a combination of all three, what you end up with is in a situation that the Z resolution gets worse as we move away from the middle in any direction, uh, which is sort of uh, highly problematic and contributes to that issue that I described where the radial, there are radial aberrations, meaning the more you move away from the middle, the worse thing looks, uh, the worse, excuse me, things look. So let me show you an example of how we might, you know, kind of, integrate all of this information try and find the best settings uh, by paying a significant price in time so what you're going to see here on the top row are single xy planes from the center of z text acquired with different settings so this is sort of the data set that we that we acquired and this blue plane represents the single um, xy plane from that stack that i'm showing you here uh, down on this part of the image, what you see is our X Z views of Z stacks maximum projected in Y. So uh, it's a cutout in the X Z dimension where I've done a little bit of projecting in, in, um, in Y and made a maximum intensity projection. So you can see it here. So it's a cut of the sample on, along a different plane. And so this is the, the, the sort of the, the first set of conditions under which I've did that, done this, which is three sheets from the right, with a very high sheet in A represented by these sort of very narrow bow tie. And then I've taken uh, a cut in the middle shown like this, and this is what you see. So the center in the center in the X dimension, things are very crisp, but as you move away from the center, uh, they look very blurry as we would expect from a high NA light sheet that's very narrow. Uh, if we now expand the numerical aperture of the light sheet such that it is much wider, what you can see if you look at it in from the X Z dimension is that now the center doesn't look as good. It's wider, but it, the resolution is way more even across the field of view, as again, we would expect. If you now use two light sheets, one from the right and one from the left, uh, we can see that things are even more even because uh, we are coming in from each side. Uh, with sheets that actually have a slightly higher NA, so they have a slightly higher resolution, which you can see here. Uh, if you look closely, you'll see that these uh, features have sort of better resolution in the Z dimension. They're crisper than these. So what else, uh, what other things can we do? And by the way, this, this going from here to here really didn't pay a price in time, uh, which is this delta T, whereas going to this did pay a price. Now it's taking... Uh, you know 2.2 times longer so another thing we can do is to use the dynamic focus so here we're, we're imaging from one side and we're taking multiple images uh, where the focus uh, of the light sheet in each image is in this position along the x dimension and what you can see there when you look at an x z projection is that the middle is very crisp and tight but really it's crisp and tight all throughout the x dimension and the price we paid is an order of magnitude longer imaging time
Now that's if we look in the middle, but if we look at the very edge, so up here, uh, the story isn't quite as good. So things in the middle, uh, the field of view in X, uh, the, Z, uh, the resolution in Z looks quite good, but as we move away from that, it doesn't look as good. And this is because we have three sheets, and as we move away from the middle in any direction, uh, the Z resolution drops. So now if instead of using three sheets, we use a single sheet from one side and do this dynamic focusing, um, Again, in the middle, it looks quite good. So again, this is uh, where we take an XZ view here, but we can also take an XZ view along the edge of the field of view. And you can see here that it looks crisp all throughout. Okay, so these are just examples of ways in which you can improve the imaging. How to do it with your particular sample is something that I'm more than happy uh, to provide advice on how to do. And I'm going to be very practical when we do that uh, and try not to have you wasting time getting uh, sort of increased resolution that you don't need, but really constrain it to um, getting the quality you need for your eventual analysis and, and then kind of uh, calling it a day there. So if you want to do tiling, so if the thing that you care about doesn't fit in your field of view or doesn't fit at the quality that you want in your field of view, you may need to do tiling. So the issue with tiling is you're going to take many uh, images of the sample that are um, have sort of slight overlaps around the edges. And so anything that makes the edges of your images look worse is going to be a problem for tiling because it, is, because it is precisely at those edges that you're going to try and stitch all this together into a single image. So these radial aberrations and the sheet shape are going to cause massive problems. And so the key to good tiling is actually cropping. So you want to crop so that the things that you will eventually stitch together have edges that are of high enough quality to make the stitching feasible. And so how big that should be, we, we have guidelines for different situations that you might find yourself in. So this is an example from Ken Hudson from the Fitzpatrick Lab at UNC of a Gerbil cochlea imaged at 12.6 mag with high NA and the crop and tile um, kind of strategy. And you can see it, you know, it's sort of a beautiful spiral shape that you can uh, see a lot of detail with uh, as a result of this sort of high NA high mag cropping and tiling strategy. So one other thing to keep in mind when you use this system is how to balance laser power and exposure. So when you're looking at the sample, uh, you can use a low laser power level and a long exposure time, as long as that long exposure is uh, short enough that you can uh, have a reasonable refresh rate of the screen, you will be able to look at things very nicely um, and very comfortably with low bleaching. But to acquire data, because of um, you know, you're covering very large samples, you want to go as fast as you possibly can. And so what you're going to do is have actually flip these so that you have a very high laser power and a very short exposure time. And this will allow you to go as fast as possible and to get all that data in the minimal amount of time. So uh, let's say you've done um, the sample prep, you've done the imaging, so what do you need to worry about after imaging? So these are the three things you're going to need to worry about, data visualization, data analysis, and data management. And so let's talk first about data management. And so to move the data around, there's sort of a slow option and a faster option that costs you more money. Let's talk about the slow option first. So for this slow option, there are things that you will need to do inside the core facility and things that you need to do outside the core facility. So things that you need to do inside the core facility. So what's in the core? In the core, we have the microscope itself an acquisition PC that controls that microscope, and then a workstation PC that allows you to work up your data on a sort of a very, very powerful and expensive computer. And so these are connected, uh, excuse me, uh, let me first describe what's outside the, the core. So then outside the core, we have your lab, and you know there's something called the network would exist in the cloud, right? Um, that's, that's not in our core. And so when you're acquiring things, you get data sets of so 10 to thousands of gigabytes, and these are moved through very fast connections to a local uh, hard drive on the acquisition PC, and then from there to other hard drives on the workstation PC. And these connections are fairly fast. They can go at up to 500 megabytes per second. Um, and then from there, uh, you know, how to get it to your lab, there are various options. You can go through slower connections from the workstation PC to an external USB, or from the acquisition or workstation PC to the network, and from there to your lab, or you could also, I guess, move this to your lab. Um, but that's going to be slow. And so for very large data sets, this ends up being rate limiting. You spend so much time moving data that you end up losing a lot of time and money. And so 
Uh, for labs that have routinely data sets that have 100 gigabytes or more, there's a faster option, which costs a little bit of money because you need to buy some hard drives and some hardware that will allow you to plug those hard drives in and out of various computers. So what you can do is you, you acquire, instead of to the to a hard drive that's inside the acquisition PC, we have these bays where you can plug in a um, solid state drive and then you can kind of unplug it very quickly. We call these hot swap drives. So you basically acquire to that uh, SSD, then you grab it and you move it and you walk it over to our workstation PC. You work up the data there, you do whatever visualization or analysis you want, and then you walk it to your lab. And it ends up being the case if you do the arithmetic for a normal human moving at normal speeds, that the data transfer rate is much faster if you physically walk a hard drive across campus rather than any connection that we can have uh, in the near or medium future uh, with any of the sort of technologies that are available right now. Um, so this was surprising to me when I found this out, but people have known this for 50 years or so, and they, you know, this kind of moving data around by carrying it in your hand um, is sort of colloquially called sneaker net. And it's the fastest way of moving data around. So um, if again, if you're using really big data sets uh, routinely, this is a, 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 an optimal way of just moving it around. And then from there, you can always uh, back it up to the network um, uh, overnight or, or over the weekend or things like this. So for data visualization, uh, there are many options, but uh, based on my experience, I would say just use Amaris on the MSL workstation. Amaris is a software that we pay a lot of money to acquire, and we pay a lot of money to maintain every year. Um, it is a very, very powerful software that allows you um, to, in my experience, the sort of best visualization experience in three dimensions. Um, and so we have that software on our workstation. You will need a very powerful workstation to be able to uh, visualize things um, that are really big. Uh, and so that is best done on the workstation, which uh, you can access remotely. And there are instructions for how to do that on our website. Now, Amaris, uh, the company that makes it, has kindly made a, kind of a free version, a viewer version of the software, which is also extremely powerful. Uh, the only problem is that for really big data sets on a typical laptop computer, uh, you're going to run into major issues. So if you don't have really big data, you, sh you, know, you should try it. This MRS viewer is free. It's fantastic. It's basically just the visualization part of the MRS without the analysis stuff. Uh, but if you have uh, light sheet data sets, it's probably not going to cut it unless you have an amazing laptop or an amazing desktop somewhere in the lab or at home. Um, OK, so that's data visualization. So now let's talk about data analysis. And so when you talk about data analysis, there's a bunch of things that you need to think about. The first is a conceptual issue, which is what should you measure? And so a lot of people aren't even used to having this kind of uh, three enormous three-dimensional data sets. And so it's a big question. It's like, what, you know, you, you're not a cinematographer. Um, so the, the movies of spinning brains will no longer get you into nature. That's very sort of 2006. So you'll have to do you're going to have to measure things. You're a scientist. And so what are you going to measure? And so you have to think carefully about what you want to measure. Um, and so just kind of work out, you know, what kind of measurements are going to help you address the biological question that you have. Uh, if you know what you want to measure, there are execution issues, which is, uh, so first of all, large data sets are very cumbersome. They're very uh, it's a pain to move them. It's a pain to back them up. It's a pain to work with them. Uh, so even if there's an algorithm available, um, it, it, you may need a very powerful computer just to be able to run it on your data or just to visualize your data. Uh, and the other issue is that algorithms are not always available. So you may know what you want to measure, but it may not be possible with software tools that are available commercially. Um, so you may need to, um, you know, get some custom script in MATLAB or Python uh, on a Linux machine up and running. Uh, and that's, you know, if someone has built that, or you may be in a situation where what you want to do may be very clearly defined, but there may be no way of doing it currently. And it may be a state of the art computer science problem to even do what you want. Uh, in which case you may need to collaborate with a computer scientist to address your problem. This is really the bottleneck. So um, the clearing problem has been mostly solved for, for you know, most tissues that you will look at. The imaging is really not that hard. There are caveats, but you know, the, we know pretty well how, how to get around imaging issues and how to get good quality data. Uh, the data sets are big, but they're not you know, insane. So you, you can store it and move it around. 
But the issue of, of, of what to measure and how to measure it, for almost every project, this is where uh, most of the heavy lifting occurs. So I would suggest that if you have a question that may be addressable by this kind of microscopy, you start thinking as early as possible in terms of metrics. What do you want to measure? Uh, how are you going to extract information from this that goes beyond the sort of simply sort of qualitative things? Um, and, and you know, what, what algorithms are you going to use to study it? So um, I hope that was useful. Uh, please contact the lab if you think this kind of microscopy would be useful for your research, and I would be happy to talk to you um, in more detail about your project.